Welcome back to Yank Speaks, everybody. Happy Thursday. It's your favorite co-hosts that are not named Andrew Yang. You've got Zach Brownman and Carly Riley. We are back on today's episode. We are talking about China is banning video games or limiting massively how many hours kids can play video games in their country, and it's fascinating. Elizabeth Holmes, founder of Theranos, is on trial, and we're talking about space junk. Finally. Finally talking about space junks or finally talking about Elizabeth Holmes? Finally, Elizabeth, finally Holmes. Elizabeth Holmes is on trial. <laughs> uh, and it's funny because uh, Carly somewhat looks like Elizabeth Holmes, uh, just as brunette. Yes. And we're going to dive into that. Uh, it's kind of a sore <laughs> spot for her, I think. The really, um, yeah, yeah, it doesn't feel great. I'm yeah, going to be a little bit about it. It's cool. Um, quick reminder, though, guys, there's a lot of fun stuff kind of pike for this podcast. Andrew's book's coming out October 5th. Made some news this week that we're not going to talk about because Politico is just leaking stuff. They don't necessarily know what's going on. So they said there was a story that Andrew Yang may be starting a third party. No one knows. Mm -hmm. No comment. I don't even know what they're talking about. Uh, All will be revealed when the book launches on October 5th. Uh, And more importantly, I'm still in mourning because the Bills lost this weekend. Carly's first trip to Buffalo, which we'll talk about. But uh, on more positive news, let's talk about China. 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 Donald Trump would say. China. Um, so look, uh, wait, can you, can I just start off? So, cause I think you understand this better than I do in terms of the, the, just like what exactly is going on. My outside perspective is China recently this week. I'll be curious, like when basically banned kids under 18 from playing more than three hours of video games just like countrywide, or is this on a specific platform? Just, that's me framing what I so far know about this, and I have a very strong reaction to that. Is this is that right? Am I correct? Here's what happened, and this is probably most of us have not. One of the things we want to do this podcast is try and bring up things that have been either brushed under the rug or not talked about uh, while everyone's freaking out about, about AOC's dress at the Met Gala, which, frankly, <laughs> who cares? Um, so look... There's a new law, or I guess in China, maybe it's a rule, uh, a new law in China that restricts people under the age of 18, so children, to only play three hours of video games a week. So they limit you, if you're under the age of 18, from playing one, you're only allowed to play one hour a day from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. on only Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, according to a local news agency there. Uh, Okay, when did this go into effect? This went into effect, uh, it just got passed. They're trying to delay it. So, you know, this past week, uh, let me get the exact date. So it was, or like August 30th 30th of August is when the news came out. Yeah. Okay, Um, so we're talking about two weeks ago. This is like not something that I'm seeing places. Like I I wasn't seeing it on Twitter. Like, is that the same for you? Are you seeing this places, this news? I haven't seen this at all. Um, I'm not sure how you found it, um, but I've been diving in. And now here's the deal. Maybe it's less big news because China had actually limited the length of time that kids could play, under 18 kids could play video games to one and a half hours a day and three hours on holidays um, in in a rule passed in 2019. So it's not completely out of character for the Chinese to ban this, but this is pretty nuts. and they have these gaming companies are required this include cell phones to Xbox to computer games. They have to use real name verification systems. Um, but frankly, like kids can still use their parents' account just like you would get around this. So it's very interesting. So I wanted to so look, China does a whole bunch of crazy things. Carly and I are not pretending to be an expert on video games or uh, these types of laws. However, I thought it was very interesting, like authoritarian freedom debate. Um, and I think you and I came down on different sides of this, Carly. So you hate this law. Am I correct? Well, my reaction is like, are you effing kidding me? Yeah, of course. Like, there, what could, like, you know, I'm thinking about if, you know, in the future I have a kid and it's a rough week. I mean, screw it. Let's take it to the extreme, right? Like you have a, like you have a death in the family and it's a really, and you're like, you know, you're really upset as a parent and so you're just like, hey, I just need my kids to be able to like zone out and be out of my hair. And if that means that for like one week, they're spending like 20 freaking hours because it's the summer and they're not in school, like playing video games. The idea that as a parent, that's not within my right. And the, the state actually is saying that's not allowed, like blows my mind. 
And I guess it shouldn't because, of course, China is a, you know, communist country and they have a dictatorship and this isn't like a, a free normal society. They're, you know, there's essentially a genocide against Uyghurs. Like there's so much about China that's completely different from from the United States. But I think because mm-hmm. it is one of the world's superpowers and, and it's it gets talked about a lot and it, it just somehow is hitting me as like incredible that that. That is the way that a whole huge part of the population lives is with that kind of government oversight and control. Yeah. I think in your example, like parents could let a kid have their own login. Uh, but look, I think you're talking about restricting. You start to get into like a public health debate. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why I'm like less. I don't love this law because I think it's pretty crazy, like an hour a day all weekend like what um like you know they kind of start to restrict fun at a certain point but here yeah. so i don't love restricting things i like governments and also i don't like government trying to enforce things they can't really enforce like this is gonna be hard to enforce um but i do love things that are good for kids like right now we have a generation of children um who are now and now adults who are legitimately addicted to their smartphones um right now according to I mean, I looked at a whole bunch of references here, um, but reviews.org did a survey. But, it's not, but it, this is one of many I found. But they, this one has 75% of Americans consider self-reported that they're addicted to cell phones. Um, they're addicted to their own phone. And according to their survey, about two, 3,000 people, about 65% of Americans check their phone up to 160 times per day, which is you know every six minutes or so, depending on you, how math you want to do. But it's a lot. Um, and combined with what we've talked about in the U.S., and this is global, where we have a mental health crisis, um, as a society right now, we are more distant, we are more alone, we are more insecure, we are less empathetic, we are less forgiving, we are more angry. These are not good things. These are, frankly, terrible things. So is um, your argument, your argument is like, this is essentially similar to the government saying, hey, if you're under 18, you can't smoke cigarettes, right? Like, we, we control things all the time when it comes to kids and governments control things about kids when it comes Correct. to health and that, that this would fall in that category. Correct. That's their, I mean, their, their quote, they quoted in a, a national press and public, uh, publication administration said, teenagers are the future of our motherland. Um, protecting their physical and mental health of minors is related to all the people's vital interests. Um, so look, this is a mental and public health move and so here's the deal like this is a this is a disaster and like globally it's not getting better right this is like these things are accelerating they're getting worse they're not getting better so we have a choice as a society we can do nothing and shrug or we could try and implement new things so i don't support this law i think it's too restrictive um do you know what is the enforcement mechanism for this like how do they actually control this so they use gamer verification services and they require the companies to do it and so um, they were require you. I don't know. Mechanically, we'd have to talk to somebody who's um, you know, f- uh, probably a minor who's growing up in China right now. Um, but uh, you know, you have to have a legitimate account um, tied to yourself for your gaming account, um, which comes a whole outside another challenge. I'm not saying this is easy to enforce, but my my point is, I'm plotting that they're trying to do something. Like they didn't make video games illegal; they restricted how much you play as a child. Um, and I think this is what we're missing today, government that tries new things. Now, I don't love like trying things on a national scale. I think I love that about the United States. You have like local communities and this should be done community by community and city by city and state by state and what works for you. But I applaud attempting to protect kids uh, in a way that's not, I mean, careful, are you really hurting careful, people? you're going to get canceled again. You're applauding the, the Chinese government. Uh, that's I applaud the attempt. I, mean, I-, I don't like the law. It makes sense. Well, I applaud the effort. So what? Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's interesting. I, I, I would be really curious to understand a little bit more about how exactly they, they plan to enforce this. The, the verification piece makes sense. I mean, I, I'm, it's a huge hit to the gaming industry because obviously China is a huge epicenter of gaming internationally. For sure. And uh, oh. so to, to have this kind of limitation is, um, it, you know, it's interesting how that will continue to these impact moves the market. I know a lot of these already have. For yeah. sure. And sure. we had... Um, we had, uh, what's his name, Bryson on, talk about esports and talk about all the benefits. Future of, of gaming? Yeah, well, we talked about all the benefits of playing video games. The kids learn to collaborate better and communicate better. Yeah. And that's why I'm not like sold on this law. But here's what I will say, and I think this is what we're missing. Like, 
we need to make hard decisions. Governments need to make hard decisions the same way parents do. Like letting, like, or we just make the easy decision and everything goes to shit. Like letting your kid play unlimited video games is easy. That's the easy way out. It's easier on the parent. Like I just distract the child. And the kid is great because like I get to play video games all day. But you know what's not easy in the long run? In the long run? What's not easy in the long run is dealing with a shithead kid who can't yeah. communicate or can't yeah. or always gets what they want or learns the right or wrong from video game chat rooms, which are notoriously under chaperone or unchaperone. So I'm against this law because it seems a little too authoritarian and this seems a little too far, but I'm in favor of trying new stuff. And so uh, again, it should be done at local level, city by city, like communities should, should start to do this. I mean, I think it's interesting. I see, I see your argument. I, I you know, it, it's probably not as ridiculous as it felt like it was to me on the face of it. Uh, it is surprising to me though that it was surprising to me that I hadn't seen this, that I had to actively be looking for interesting stories for the purpose of this podcast to find this because... That's why I bring it up. Like, how is this not talked about? And it wasn't talked about 2019 either. As much as I, I don't support the... I don't support this kind of government intervention. I mean, like, <laughs> it does support the narrative that China's just going to continue to eat our lunch, right? Because they yeah. they have the ability to impose draconian measures that can make for very effective productive citizens and you know that's who we're competing against and increasingly competing against in a global workforce and in a global economy so you know i think it it should give parents uh food for thought here in this country of like how are you monitoring your kids uh, technology consumption um because we're probably frying the brains of a lot of american youths oh yeah and what's, what's crazy is, and we were talking about this last episode, talking about like when the government tries to regulate things, it can be a disaster. Like there's, there's a difference in the morality and the, and the practice, right? Mm. Um, but we are, be, are entering an era where we're not going to have a choice because inaction will, um, is becoming more and more unacceptable. And that's kind of where I'm like struck, like what where I'm mean? at here. Like normally this law like this, like banning video games, like what the hell? Like let us have our thing, right? Let us like, who cares, right? But it's actually frying children's brains and it's actually making all of us more depressed and more angry and more isolated and all well, the things do, do that you're like, the numbers are overwhelming. Because we just said that video games actually come with a lot of benefits. Do we need to distinguish between video games and just like mindless social media scrolling? Like, Well, no, like- I think anything in excess becomes a disaster. And so I agree with you. You could distinguish between social media and that sort of clickbait stuff and video and, um, you know, th- there's a difference between those, but, um, I don't think there's any evidence that letting a child play video games whenever he or she wants it at all hours is a net positive for the child. Um, you know, I think like most things in moderation, it's like you'd say the same thing about someone who played basketball 24 uh, seven. It might stunt their development in other areas. Um, so and not video game basketball, real basketball. So I, look, I don't know if government intervention is the answer here, but at some point, and now social media is a bigger problem um, or just addiction to smartphones in general, which video games are a part of. Um, this is getting worse, not better. We have to mm-hmm. do something. Um, I'd rather do something than nothing. And or we I just all embrace the ready player one regimes, future but. that we are going to enter someday. Uh, no, I, I kid. I think, all right, tweeted us your initial reaction to this, to hearing yeah. about this. Let us know if you've heard about it previously or if this is the first you're hearing about it. If you're also shocked that this wasn't more of a thing that people were talking about, maybe it really is just me, but this just felt like um, really fascinating to, to learn that this was going on. So I'm, I'm Carly P. Riley on Twitter. What are you, Zach Grauman? Zach underscore Grauman. But if you just look up Zach Grauman, I think if I find me, excuse me. Uh, um, I, for, I, I think I own Zach Grauman, but I've lost the password. It's a long story. Anyway, um, but this is getting worse, not better. Like, I, And one of the things, uh, we, we're not going to talk deep down, but Facebook has a partnership with Ray-Ban right now. And you can literally like, ima- remember, remember what the snap glasses were that Snapchat came out with, what were they called? Snap goggles. I don't remember. Um, no, I don't remember. They those. have those, but they're cooler, like way cooler, way smaller, more effective. Um, so what are they for? I don't like, understand. You can take video at any time without anyone noticing. Like there's your, stuff that, and do we, no, it's kind of the same as a smartphone right now. Anyone can videotape you. People do all the time, but it's just going to be more easy to access unaware it's happening kids are addicted adults are addicted like it's the wild west at some point the government's probably gonna have to do something while to prevent us from all going to shit um 
And I think we should pick people over the money. Like, I think the, the gaming industry can take a small hit. Oh, I don't care uh, about that either. But I also pick freedom over, like, this is where I, I start to be a little conservative, mm-hmm. right? Is like, I, I yeah. very much value a parent's ability to make decisions about their own kids as opposed to the government stepping in and, and making those decisions. So that, that's where Deeper the Deeper questions, the sort of libertarian yeah. I think all this stuff works when you educate way. your populace. Um, but anyway. Agreed. Anyway. Okay. Real talk, how is your mental health? If it's like mine, probably not that great. I'm losing my mind post-COVID, getting a little better, and the reason I'm getting better is because of our sponsor, BetterHelp, which is amazing, secure, and well, frankly, fairly priced counseling done securely online. So you can start communication and get paired with a licensed professional on a safe, private, online environment that's super convenient within 48 hours. It's not a crisis line, it's not self-help, it's professional counseling done securely online. You can talk to your counselor anytime, you get timely and thoughtful responses. I love my counselor, it's freaking awesome, and you can get advice on depression or anger or stress or family conflicts, whatever you're going through. BetterHelp is freaking awesome and it's confidential, convenient, professional, affordable, all the things you need done conveniently online. So I want you to start living a happier life today. And as a listener, you're going to get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor, betterhelp.com slash yang. So join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash yang. Sports have long been an important and defining part of our history. With their impact and influence, key moments in sports have helped shape, heal, and inspire. It has been said that I have two alternatives, either go to jail or go to the army. But I would like to say that there is another alternative. That alternative is justice. I'm Doc Rivers, and I'm proud to present a new podcast documentary series called It Was Said Sports, where I guide you through six of the most impactful and timeless speeches in sports history. The question has already been answered. Should we be here? Yes. Listen and follow It Was Said Sports, a documentary podcast presentation of Shining City Audio, a C-13 Originals, and John Meacham Studio. Available now wherever you listen to your podcasts. Okay, Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, Yeah, this one, this one's personal because I, I do, I don't know in this particular moment, in this particular video, if I, if I'm going to come across as looking like her, but there, there is a, a certain level like of this. resemblance there. What do you mean? If you do this. Well, no, no, Elizabeth you really want right? to know what it is. It's my jowls, right? Like I have sort Your of a, jowls. a, yeah, I have a, a heavy bottom weighted face. You can't really tell it necessarily. Your eyes are similar. I don't know about the nose. The eyes, it's the jowls, it's the, you know, whatever. The worst you, people to be compared to. If you Google to, image wise. her, well, sh- she's, I think, engaged still to like a multi-millionaire, billionaire, like hotelier or something. So she's doing just fine. Oh, that's surprising. Um, she loves a fancy life. Okay, let's talk about Elizabeth Holmes. For those of you who don't know. So... Backstory on Elizabeth Holmes. I mean, I'm sure most everyone knows give me a quick, the story of Theranos, but I'm going to give you the quick, 30 the quick rundown. rundown. And and I will say, if you are interested, if you like 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 big, huge cons in the corporate world, this is a great one. And the book, um, I think it's called Bad Blood by John Carreyrou. Mm-hmm. That's the one. And there was an HBO it's documentary, awesome. also awesome. Yeah, it, it, that, that might be based on bad blood. Anyhow, and, he, and John Kerry now has a podcast where he's tracking the current trial of Elizabeth Holmes. Okay, here we go. Called Elizabeth the Inventor Holmes. Out for Blood in Silicon Valley. Great. Elizabeth Holmes, Stanford student, drops out of Stanford because she decides to pursue a business uh, where basically she's able to test people for a whole range of diseases, so she claims, with just a prick of blood. So she sets out to say, how can we revolutionize like blood, the blood drawing industry? Because as anyone knows right now, you get your blood drawn to test for all different things. And that process is like kind of horrible. I actually am like mildly Quest diagnostics around it. sucks. Yes. We've all dealt yeah, with it in COVID. And, and, Those you know, testing and sites so suck. They, they would, they, you know, it's like a needle in your arm. They put this tourniquet around you. Like it's, it's a pretty awful It takes awful forever. Experience. Tough to read. It takes forever. They're lots of cheap. blood. It's awful. So she was yeah. like, we're revolutionizing this now. We're going to disrupt pr- it. A pinprick of blood 
we can test for all the things that you used to have to get a whole blood draw for. So she's mm-hmm. like, I believe, 19 years old when she drops out of Stanford to start pursuing this. She was a biotech, whatever, major at Stanford. And she becomes one of the hottest tech properties in Silicon Valley. So the Theranos board is like crazy. It's Henry Kissinger. It's George Shultz, who was a senior political member of the Reagan administration. Um, you'll note, interestingly, none of those people have a background in science or biotech. No doctors. Conveniently. Um, <laughs> and the, it gets a valuation, I think, of like $9 billion at its peak. She's yeah. on the cover of all these magazines as, you know, a billionaire. And to be fair. She's, she's very jobs like. If you watch her, like, TED to or like her pitch, it's pretty awesome. Oh, she's it's a like super masterful salesperson, as Wonderful. all great con yeah. artists are. We all drink. And, all and drink everybody, the if you Keep if going. you've heard Elizabeth Holmes ever, and and again, this may all be repeat for folks, but she has this very deep voice. Now, one of my favorite internet conspiracies is that that is not Elizabeth Holmes' real voice. There's not a lot of like weight to it, but there are a couple of people who say they knew her when she was younger or knew her at Stanford before she dropped out, like a professor who says that her voice was not like that, and. There's this podcast interview. If you want to go deep, you can look this up. There's this podcast interview with Elizabeth Holmes where for like a split second, she like reverts into a voice and a laugh that sound so much more natural. Like it, it, you just have this moment where you're like, oh, that sounds like her. And it's much higher pitched. It's nothing like her deep voice. And then it immediately flips back to like the weird, deep, raspy Elizabeth Holmes. She does kind of talk. Talk like this. it's, It's very strange. And I think there's a really interesting, you know, conversation there about, that you know, one of the one of the few women to pull off a con like this also happens to kind of sound masculine, and, and what does that mean in terms of how people tend to trust masculine voices more? I don't know. I feel like people have done pods on this. All the like, she's a fascinating I'm sure. Yes, yeah. So for sure. anyhow, Books that's uh, you know the 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 punchline here is that the whole thing was essentially a fraud, which is to say she was claiming to investors, she was claiming to the public that the technology they had was way further along than it actually was, and the terrifying thing was that she had actually established partnerships with I believe it was Walgreens with like mm-hmm. with with pharmacies around the country oh, who this were shit using went live. her technology this went and live. and people were getting misdiagnosed on the basis of Theranos and their technology in fact they were getting blood samples sent back and Theranos was using other companies technology to try and get diagnoses because their own tech was so bad so it, you know a total disaster John Kerry was the one who broke this story and eventually broke this con she had a you know, a fabulous fall from grace. And her her trial was supposed to be last year during COVID or during COVID at some point it got pushed back. And now here, finally, we are hopefully having our, our day of retribution. Elizabeth Holmes is on trial and we will see if she actually serves prison time, which she of course should, and I would be shocked if she did not, for defrauding investors, for putting public safety at, in jeopardy, et cetera. Yeah, so trial's supposed to go 13 weeks or so. She's facing up to 20 years in prison. There's a couple podcasts on this. We'll link to them because we're not Elizabeth Holm experts. We're just fans of entrepreneurship and having fun watching this nonsense. Uh, I think here's a couple thoughts I have real quick, Carl. I think um, one, I'm, I'm like torn, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, so one, so her defense, actually look clear, her defense is going to be that she was in a relationship with the COO. Well, she uh, was. And that Sunny he was, Van well, Buren or whatever. Which is, and name that is. he was a real manipulative one, which is going to be fascinating to watch. But here's my here's why I'm torn. On one end, I think people should be punished actually more severely for this. I think it's kind of ben BS what? where you have people than, uh, I mean, m- most other crimes. I think it's like, uh, like, I think it should be up there with, I mean, I guess it's tough to say is like morally equivalent of like murder or types of, of types of violence, but... No, no, I believe she's a sociopath and she's a menace to society because she did put people's lives at risk. I mean, she was, by 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 her own just fortune, nobody did die because of misdiagnoses of theranosis, but like somebody could have died. So it's simply convenient that nobody did. One person was told they had a miscarriage they never had. Another person was told they had, uh, I think it was cancer. colon cancer. Yes. Um, like she messed with people, lied to people, lied to investors, lied to patients, like the whole thing. Um, so I, I think like 20 years doesn't sound like enough when you think about it. Um, now maybe hype, but it seems extremely wrong. Um, especially given like how much we praise this, like knowing it was a lie. It's like epic to see. Um, the second thing though, on the other hand, my other thing that's torn is like, 
I know the American appetite and you and I are contributing to it right now to like watch people fall or it's like you see somebody go up like it's like a human instinct in some ways and well, um, this is an epic story uh, of course it is but it's like the Lance Armstrong story it's like you go down the list of, of uh, like these epic Tiger Woods like these epic fall from graces like we can't get enough of them and my fear is in the healthcare space we need desperately risk and entrepreneurs and people to get into this space to disrupt it. Like that Quest Diagnostic company like model is still dark and messed up. Now no one wants to touch it because of this debacle. And so the other hand, well, I want her to be, and she deserves to be punished. I, I'm sure she's been punished in many ways too. This hasn't been a fun experience for her, but she hurt a lot of people and needs to go to jail. I believe she's a sociopath who can't feel pain, but whatever. Like, I don't think she feels really? pain. And just because you're a sociopath doesn't mean you feel pain, right? You no, no, it is. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's You can't feel others' pain, right? No, you don't, can't feel, well, you can't feel fear. Hmm. That's not the definition of a sociopath. It, it, There's maybe yeah. one definition of sociopath. Um, there's a sociopath, like, no regard for anybody else or other, other human lives. Um, I don't know. It doesn't matter. The point is, like, I th- I just, uh, watching this, this, this hasn't got a ton of news. I mean, it's been covered, but it hasn't been as crazy and particularly, like, if you're a Gen Z or if you're young listening to this, you probably haven't heard of this because we only get our news when it goes viral and it's not really viral yet. I'm sure parts of this will go viral as the trial comes out, but we'll be watching with bated breath. Is that how you say that? Okay. Huh? Yeah, with bated breath. Uh, tests nice. done for sociopaths, like one of the early tests of sociopaths was they would like shock people, shock, it was done with prisoners and you would like shock prisoners or do these horrible things with prisoners and then that were painful and then you would track their brainwave response in advance of doing it again. And in sociopaths, there was no elevated sense of fear going into that second wave of pain. Whereas for non-sociopaths, once they felt the pain once, then they were anticipatorily afraid of the second shock. So there is a thing to, there is a connection between fear and sociopaths in addition to like the general antisocial behavior thing. Um, All right. I think it's, it's interesting. Yes, we need entrepreneurs to take risks, but certainly... Not that she much. She went way, way, way too far. <laughs> you a know fun fact about Elizabeth Holmes is that her father worked for Enron, which was one of the other major corporate, like, just. Do we con- know if he was involved in like actual no, Enron he was scandals? Not. He was. He was too low on the totem pole. But interesting Dang. that, you know, she saw what happened to Enron, and her father lost his job at Enron as a result of obviously Enron imploding. And said, for you know, I'll go into fraud. Yeah, well, well, uh, for those who don't know, Enron was also engaged in like hyper aggressive that ultimately crossed over into fraudulent is what you're talking about. Uh, yes. practices about like their, about how much their revenue and they were, they were booking revenue. They'd like sign a deal with like a company in India to build some whatever power plant thing in like 2025. And they would anticipate all of the revenue they were ever going to get from that deal and put it on the books in like 1997. That's all an exaggeration, but that's essentially what they were doing, which was, it was yeah, called mark to market accounting or whatever. It was fascinating. Um, People are crazy. Um, Anyway, they should be punished for it. Um, but I, I, in a way that you ideally don't stifle innovation. Um, oh, yeah, I'm not worried fear. about that in the least. If people can't there distinguish between taking risks as, a, as an entrepreneur and Elizabeth Holmes, then you should not be in the entrepreneurial space. Fair enough. <laughs> Whether you realize it or not, you're likely way more creative than you think. And in a world where we're all sort of geared towards being a little more science than art, I think it's important to bring out your creative side, which is why we chose to have Skillshare as one of our sponsors on this podcast, because they help you bring out your creative side. So you can take a class to learn to be more creative in a whole bunch of different areas. Right now, this is ridiculous, but it's pretty cool. I'm taking a class on indoor gardening and how to grow house plants because frankly, my New York City apartment could use a little more energy. Yeah, that's probably a good way to put it. Anyway, you can take classes on how to edit YouTube videos or how to do portrait photography or how to do video on Instagram. There's a ton of different things, whether it's a hobby or a side hustle or just a way you want to learn to do more things. Skillshare is pretty freaking awesome. And it's incredibly affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes or workshops. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. So right now, I want you to explore your creativity with Skillshare.com slash Yang. So go to Skillshare.com slash Yang and get one month free trial of a premium membership. That's one month of a premium membership at Skillshare.com slash Yang. Become a little more creative, better yourself, Skillshare.com slash Yang.
Okay, last thing we want to talk about, space trash. Because we did an episode on Billionaire's Space, and there's another one joining. And I love this one. I, I got some hate last time. I don't care. I get a lot of hate. I get hate all the time. Um, but we did an episode on Billionaires in Space. So Dal did this one. Steve Wozniak, former co-founder of Apple with Steve Jobs, is launching a space company. And now before you, before you, before you, before you freak out, it's not like a Musk, Bezos, Branson building a rocket company. This is different. It's called Privateer. He's launching it this week. He hasn't launched it yet. We're recording this on Tuesday the 14th, but it'll be probably launched at the, what's it called? At the Amos Tech Festival in Maui right now. Um, Whoa, Maui. But, oh yeah, Maui, we should go. Um, <laughs> it's called Privateer. It's a new satellite company focused on monitoring and cleaning up objects in space. They get rid of space junk. And then I went down the rabbit hole, Carl. Are you aware of the problems we have with space junk, space trash? I, not at all. I'm yeah, fascinated okay. to hear well, more though. Here we are, folks. <laughs> um, I'm not an expert on space junk, but I have read five articles from different sources um, and used my critical thinking skills to bring this to you, Yank Speaks audience. So here's the deal. Space has become a dumping ground for dead satellites um, and launch vehicle rockets. Basically, it's the wild, wild west. People like putting shit up there, and <laughs> just leaving it. Um, uh, and it's not just like companies, like, you know, I, you know, any, you know, media company throws a satellite up there. Google probably has a bunch of satellites up there. And, you know, they get old they launch new ones and they let that one keep ordering the earth. Um, in 2019, NASA called <laughs> low earth orbit, which is where these satellites and junk are, the world's largest gar garbage dump with nearly 6,000 tons of waste. And it has warned, NASA's warned, warned us that space junk threatened space goers with garbage hurtling up to seven times faster than a bullet. <laughs> Wait, but so it, does it threaten Earth or does it just threaten people? Not that I think no, this space is great, goers. but who space are going goers. to, okay. So I can, yes, I can hear the, goers. I can hear the world collectively going, all right, let them get hit by space junk if yeah, they no have the shit. money but, to go to the moon. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Like, if we're watching like the first man trip to Mars, <laughs> no, and of course, literally, and this, I'm and this, like, crude. literally, um, paint flecks, like chips of paint, have smashed shuttle windows. Like, oh if gosh. you are, we're flying the first man mission to Mars, and like someone's like candy bar wrapper flew out a window and like slices through the fuel tank and blows it up. Like, that's gonna be really sad. Wow. Um, so we've literally already started. We've. Elon Musk is trying to get us to Mars slash space because we've like successfully pollut polluted this planet like out of usability and we're about to basically pollute space out of usability before we even get there. Is or at least the, the, the short, yeah, the short term spot around Earth. I mean, it's not like, it's not, okay. it's not that I'm you can't clean it up, it's just no but... one's doing it. Um, there, but NASA, like NASA monitors the big ones because they're like, this is a problem. So they're monitoring 27,000 pieces of larger space junk. Which oh is my God. 27, like, like people ask like, what do your tax dollars go to? This shit, um, <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. So, and cleanup costs money that we're not allocating right now. So Jim Bridenstine, who's the uh, former NASA administrator who is urging Congress to fund a $15 million cleanup mission. He said in the last two weeks, um, said this last year, but there have been, of course, two weeks, there have been three high concern pungent high concern potential conjunctions and debris is getting worse. He had tweeted that. So wow. um, now he may be overblowing it because it gets some money for this, but it is, um, they've been talking about this as an ex, um, exponential problem. It just gets worse over time. Yeah, right? that um, makes sense. Well, and as you have more and, of like of these trips out to space, right? Wouldn't it? Yeah. So what is cool is that this is actually a pretty cool <laughs> entrepreneurial like field. Um, and so you have this company that Wozniak's starting. Uh, they're still in stealth mode, so we'll see if they have anything cool. But the ideas to solve this is why I'm so fascinated. The ideas to fix this are right out of fucking sci-fi. It's like lasers, space claws, tentacles, like magnets, you fucking name it. So <laughs> the company that the Japanese, and I guess in partnership with um, the United Kingdom's government are funding is a company called Astroscale, which like, by the way, if you make a space company, you got to give it a sick name, you know? Um, so they do, they have three things. They have uh, what they call end of life services for satellites. So it's like a docking mechanism you can put on your satellite that like brings it to its, uh, a big ass magnet to get destroyed. Or like they'll have a magnet that like pulls it through the earth's atmosphere and like burns that shit up. Um, 
they do active debris removal, which I think they're using magnets. And then the other one, they started testing like magnetic docking systems that would tow future space junk um, and use the yeah. atmosphere as like the incinerator I was talking about. So, um, I have anyway, a call in three minutes. So, whatever. But anyway, that's okay, my way of we'll saying that. that's freaking awesome. And yeah, space junk. So, I mean, yeah, it's yeah, if you guys I are working on this, but if you guys are working on anything in space junk, please DM me because uh, this type of stuff. <laughs> I want, I want to get involved. Like, I feel left behind. Like, Waz didn't call me. What the hell? Uh, oh, anyway. <laughs> Good for um, Waz. Yeah. So, anyway, guys, um, that's our show today. On a more important point, um, the Bills are 0-1, and this is supposed to be our Super Bowl year, so we're very upset. But we play Miami next week. I took Carly to Buffalo. Uh, sure, I had a great with, with our, first the whole Buffalo fan, experience. The whole Groundman fan came. Yeah. And I will say this. She missed. She didn't get in until late, so she missed it. But the, I did have the best – Buffalo wings I've ever had in my entire life. A place called Bar Bill, and they were honey butter barbecue Cajun buffalo wings. They also had the regular ones, which were dynamite too. But they were like, like hubba hubba good. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> hubba hubba. Anyway, I missed them, so I have no comment. But uh, great first Buffalo experience. Groundmans, no Minus bit of Buffalo to Groundmans. I went and, all in. Uh, yeah, well, I, went all in. I should have got that. No okay. Way. Thank you all. We love you all. We love you guys. We're so More grateful. More stuff coming down. Thanks for continuing to listen. And uh, we'll keep you posted. More yeah. stuff coming down the we'll, pike. See you we'll next be Thursday. Here next week. Bye.